Ladies and sinners, welcome to another Tuesday evening edition of the Sin City Sports Show presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. This is IE Vegas, where we talk all things Vegas sports. Lots to t- touch base on the show today. Um, holiday weekend's around the corner, guys. Make sure you guys take care of yourselves. Um, be a family the best you can. Mental health is a serious thing right now. I believe in it. I think some people just have a really rough time on the holidays. So if you know of somebody, obviously with with care and consideration, don't be afraid to invite them to their to your family deal. My family's always done it. Again, you just don't know what people are going through on the holidays. Especially, it could be the first holiday without somebody, right? Um, that person could just be alone. I don't know. Just consider your neighbors, man. Consider the people you know you work with. Um, sometimes you just create lifelong friends. So that, that that would be my piece for today. I wish everybody the best. Obviously, good health. I think there's some weird cold going on in the United States right now. It's like it's it's not it's not even a stomach flu. It's like a head cold, but it's really kind of flu symptoms and stuff like that. Hoping everybody. I'm sure it she could be some sort of COVID strain, of course. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody's healthy. This is Kale Henderson, the host of the Sin City Sports Show. You guys can get at us on our Twitter forums at Sin City underscore IESR at Kale underscore Henderson, where we talk all things Vegas sports. When we get back here, we're going to stop right into UNLV football and their great season. Honestly, excellent season. First season under Barry Odom. When we get back here on the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio. And welcome into another Tuesday evening edition of the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. I'm your host, Kale Henderson. Again, you guys can get at us on our Twitter forums, at Sin City underscore IESR, at Kale underscore Henderson, where we talk all things Vegas sports. If you miss a show, don't worry about that. Don't worry about that. We got podcasts everywhere, man. Spreaker podcasts, uh, Apple podcasts, Spotify, it seems to be the most popular amongst my friends that listen to the show. Um, good pods. I mean, you got Google pods. I mean, we're everywhere, man. So if you miss a show, hit like, hit follow, go to all the forums. If you would like follow on Twitter, like follow on, on the YouTube page, IE sports radio, YouTube page, uh, list, you can check back on any of our stuff. Like, listen, we're accessible. We're there and ready to go. Especially when it comes to talking about our Vegas sports. UNLV had one hell of a season, by the way, guys, um, Remember in the offseason we talked about, you know, this, this would be first year under under head coach Barry Odom. I was one of those that wasn't quite in agreement with parting ways with Marcus Arroyo in such an abrupt fashion. I thought that he deserved another year. I mean, the guy was hired, and I'll say it like this. Before we get into Barry Odom, I'll say it like this. Marcus Arroyo was given the most daunting task you could ask for, and here's why, right? In my opinion... What what hurt Marcus Arroyo is that he was hired during the COVID season. Like, his very first season was 2020 as the head coach at UNLV. So he didn't have an offseason. He, he had to rely on video training or video recruiting and all that other jazz. They weren't even sure they were going to have a season. Like, it was a shortened year, right? I think that hurt him. Being a first-year head coach and, and taking over a program in 2020 would not have been fun. But he was doing a pretty good job, and you saw improvement from year one to year two. That improvement just wasn't good enough. Um, after 2022, they were fighting for a bowl position. Didn't quite get it. Again, I thought that they needed to address the depth piece. I thought that Marcus Arroyo deserved a fourth year because I think I think the results would have been pretty similar to this year. Regardless, UNLV's got. I mean, I think they got a lot a really talented football team. Ricky White's one of the one of the best wide receivers in the nation. I don't care what anybody says. He's he 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 plays very well. He plays fast. He catches almost everything that touches his hands. And you can't teach that. And, and that's something that the NFL needs. It's, it's very possible that Ricky White, who actually just, 
I think he just he just declared declared for the NFL draft. It's very possible Ricky White, uh, you know, is a late round draft pick and he plays really well depending on the system he's in because just the, just his style of play, it makes sense. With that, so we got to give a shout out to our platform, IE Sports Radio, for the last nine years. IE Sports Radio has brought you amazing content ranging from interviewing legendary athletes, coaches, and other authorized media personnel to building tailor-made shows dedicated to all major cities around the country. Make sure you follow us on IE Sports Radio on t- make sure you follow us at IE Sports Radio on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok to keep up with the latest in sports. And with our shows, also check out iesportsradio.com for sports news, IE Sports Radio blog, our Hall of Fame, Fans of the Month, pages dedicated to each podcast on the network, our IE Sports Radio community forum, and stop by the store and check out the latest merch. Thank you for making IE Sports Radio your direct feed for all that is sports. Taryn, Adam, thank you guys so much for tuning in. You guys are the greatest of teammates. Um... Terrence says, I'm currently at a casino resort while listening. Sadly, not in Vegas, though. Oh, yeah? Were you in Reno? You in Reno, Nevada? Little Vegas? Maybe you're in Atlantic City. I don't know. Interesting. I mean, they have, they have like, slots everywhere now. It's mini, conti- mini casinos everywhere now. I see slots in gas stations all the time. Pechanga. Okay, you're going to have to tell me where that's at. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a Nebraska boy, man. I'm a I'm a beef fit, corn fed. Yeah, Pachanga. I don't I don't know where that's at, bro. You're gonna have to help me out there. Oh. Okay. Hope you're having a good time, bud. Adam Carney tunes into the show. Uh, whatever that. Yeah, I'm I'm guessing you're talking about the flu. Whatever that was, zero out of ten. Yeah, you know, honestly, man, it wasn't like unbearable. Compared to some flus where you're just achy and miserable and you're puking and you have a fever. It's nothing like that. It's just w- really weird symptoms. You know, people are getting headaches, sore throats, phlegm, which is never fun. Uh, you have a cough that doesn't seem to want to go away. I think the thing that affected me most this last time around, and I got it because my nieces and nephews, when we were on our trip, all of them were sick for some reason. Like, they're just a Petri dish of, of, of SARS and bird flu. I'm just kidding. They don't do that, but they don't have that. But still... It's just, it feels like those kids are always sick. There's four of them. Uh, my brother's been busy. Uh, cute kids. Unbelievably cute kids. But they're always sick. And kids are disgusting. But regardless, they were all sick. And I think everybody got some sort of it towards the end of the trip. Um, so on the way home, I'm driving home. It's like a 12 and a half hour drive from you know Utah to Lincoln. And I'm just sucking down cough drops like there's no no tomorrow, man. Because, like, I was white-knuckling it most of the way anyway because of all the black ice and everything like that. I didn't want, you know, coughing and stuff and being uncomfortable to be a distraction. So, yeah. It was a weird it was a weird uh, little flu there, Adam. Weird little flu. Hope everybody – and that's part of the reason why I said hope everybody's well. You know, everybody's affected in different ways. And uh, you just – and then especially to the holidays, man. You just never know what people are going through. You just don't. You know, sometimes the holidays is just a really, really rough time for people. And if you know that, if you know somebody that's affected, dude, just please reach out to those people. Invite them to your family get-togethers. It's one extra plate, right? Like, that can't hurt you. Um, and it's good It's good karma. I, I believe in karma. It's goodwill. It's good karma. And what goes around comes around. And I think if you're a community member like that, uh, makes a huge difference. It says schools are giant petri dishes for for diseases. Absolutely, 100%. Yeah. What doesn't help is well, they they don't do it anymore. But basically, um, my my brother's wife, their family used to run basically a, a milk farm or a, a dairy farm. Um, and yeah, I can't imagine the crap that they were around all the time with with cows shitting everywhere and having to deal with that and stuff like that. That would, that would have been gross. But, yeah, I can't imagine what schools are like, too. I would imagine they're the same thing. I mean, you're probably safer at a farm than you are at a school. Just saying. Your voice still isn't 100%. It won't be. Yeah, you, you probably got another week or so of recovery, man. Straight up. You know, my voice wasn't really affected. I'll say this. Um, I drank a lot of electrolytes. So I had two scoops of, like, branch-chain amino acids that have, like, ten times the electrolytes 
of a Gatorade and but but like a fraction of the sugar, right? Like an like maybe an eighteenth of the sugar, grams of sugar. By the way, Gatorade's ridiculous anymore. I know this is a bit off topic, but it is sports. It is a sports drink. Uh, Gatorade has like twelve grams of sugar in just like a thirty-two ounce Gatorade now. It's crazy. When we were kids, there wasn't that much sugar, man. It still tasted good. Now it's just just crazy, man. It just doesn't make sense. I I took two scoops of my branch chain amino acids, man, a day while we were there. I think I recovered extremely, I th very quickly because I took those things. So just something to think about, Adam, if you can. Go get those liquid IVs. Take two of those a day. One in the morning, you know, one in the afternoon, or, or getting close to whatever, so that way you're hydrated and the electrolytes are keeping you up and running. That's the big thing when you're ill, man. If you're not hydrated, you're screwed. And one of those little packets, every every couple hours, or one of those little packets, twice a day, and if you supplement some water or whatever in between there, you're going to be hydrated for the whole day. You're you're not going to have any issues. Back to UNLV, guys. Barry Odom, because we were transitioning from Marcus Arroyo, right? Marcus Arroyo was let go. I guess UNLV, UNLV didn't think that he could quite get it done. They reached out to Barry Odom. Barry Odom um, was a very successful defensive coordinator at Missouri. Uh, he's he's definitely when, when you listen to his press conferences, man, this guy is like a down to earth. You can tell he's very he's definitely much very much an alpha male. Uh, but it seems as though this team has responded really well to him because in his first season they went nine and three in the regular season. Nine and three. Lost the Mountain West Championship to Boise State. Um, that's not a huge shocker because Boise State is just. I think Boise State's one of the more underrated programs in the country. I don't think they're talked about enough, and I think it's because they're in Boise, Idaho. Um, what they're famous for is that blue field. But overall, dude. I mean, re respectfully, dude, it's it's one of the best. It's one of the best football programs in the nation. Um, m one of my favorite bowl games ever was that Orange Bowl with Boise State and Oklahoma where the Statue of Liberty play came out. That was awesome. I think it was no more than three or four years later than it was TCU, uh, Boise State going at it, right? That was cool as hell too. So there's, there's a lot of good football in the Mountain West. I think there's going to be better football in the Mountain West. San Diego State landed a really good football coach in Sean Lewis. Um, Sean Lewis, for whatever reason, was demoted in Colorado. I don't think play calling was the issue in Colorado, especially on the offensive side, considering their first six weeks they averaged like 38 points a game. Um, I think the one, I think it was week seven, week six or week seven, they played Oregon. But through their first five weeks, they averaged 38 points a game. That tells me the offense isn't an issue. If you're still losing games after having a 38 you know, putting up 30, 38 points, your defense is awful. And I'll say this, Colorado is down right now. A lot of people are really bleak on them. I wouldn't be. Prime is going to get it done. Prime is going to find players. Players will be attracted to the Prime brand. They will be attracted to Colorado because Deion Sanders is there. And and I think he's serious, and I think, I think especially in the black community, I'm not, you know, it is what it is, but especially in the black community, they have a great respect for Deion Sanders. I think that he's going to rake up the talent there. I think there's going to be talent there that wasn't there in previous you know decade because Deion Sanders is there. So I do think that Colorado is going to be a really good team. It helps that they're moving the Big 12. It really does. I think the best team in the Big 12 is going to be Utah for the next few years. I'm not just saying that because I'm a fan of the program. I think Kyle Whittingham is a is a hell of a coach. I don't know how much longer he has at Utah, but Utah is an excellent program. That's that's like we went and saw a game. We went and saw Utah play Colorado in Salt Lake at you know the day we were leaving Salt Lake and visiting family. It was a blast, man. Great atmosphere, ton of fun. Um really creepy stadium. Uh once you get past row 35, it's like it's like bent steel held together by obviously, you know, Excellent framework and everything like that. Steel, you know, hardcore framework. But, dude, if people were hopping around, you could feel it vibrating throughout the entire stadium. It was it was pretty crazy. Um, but them Mormons are smart. They're great architects. So I'm not, I'm not going to argue with them. Um, I'll say this. I think UNLV could – UNLV has to keep up this trend. Barry Odom has to continue this momentum. Um, if Barry Odom wants to continue being the coach in years to come – or have a chance to be a Power 5 head coach again. Um, I think his opportunity is UNLV for sure because he's got a very attractive spot. The thing is, 
you have to compete against really good coaches in the Mountain West. Fresno State's an excellent team. Like, there's no if ands, or buts. Uh, Fresno State's an excellent team. San Jose State's a really good team, or they can be a good team. They're cyclical, but they're in a great spot. Um, I don't know why Oregon State just doesn't just move to the Mountain West. Just kidding, but still, Pac-12 is, you know, Mountain West teams might be better than Pac-12 teams. Um, Northwestern is going to be playing Utah in Las Vegas right before Christmas. Yes, and I hate to say this, Adam, because I know you're a Chicago guy, but I think Northwestern gets the shit kicked out of them in that game. Utah is just different, man. Listen, I'm really happy for Northwestern. I think that interim head coach who is now, I think he was named the head coach, to correct me if I'm wrong, I thought he had an excellent year, especially after the whole Fitzgerald distraction and everything that was going on. I mean, coach Fitzgerald's a good coach, by the way. Um, just bad things happen, and you can't let that happen in your program. It's optics. It's a business above all. At the end of the day, um, I like the new I like the new coach for Northwestern. I just don't know. Utah's just a much more talented team. They're a very deep roster. Very deep roster. They got older guys. They got a bunch of juniors playing. Um, that team next year will be pretty interesting. It wouldn't surprise me if Utah wins the, the Big 12 next year. Uh, they're going to have their hands full with Oklahoma State and stuff like that. I just think Utah plays a style of, of, of offense and defense that's just extremely physical. And I don't think that's something the Big 12 is used to. I know the Pac-12 wasn't used to it for years. It is what it is. He goes, I'm still shocked Northwestern more than two games. Yeah, dude. Credit to the coaching staff. Credit to those players. I mean, what a distraction at the beginning of the season, the hazing and stuff that went on. And they were still somehow able to muster up, what was it, seven wins? What an incredible year. I couldn't believe they couldn't beat Iowa at the end because Iowa can't score more than five points a game. I'm glad that coach has been getting fired. I, I hate to say that because you don't want to wish that on somebody, but Brian Ferentz is awful. Like, he's he's atrocious, man. He's he's just – you just don't want people like him running running your offense, that's for sure, but – um, Northwestern, great year. And UNLV. UNLV kind of got a bad... <laughs> I mean, UNLV is going to be playing in the... Give me one second, please. I just had that up. I'm a dingleberry. Give me a moment. I know they're playing Kansas. And it's a, it's like a fixed interest rate bowl or something like that. So UNLV is going to play Kansas. I don't know if you guys know anything about Kansas, but they're a really good football team. People may not think that, but I, I believe that Lance Leipold and Kansas are, are doing excellent things. I don't know if that's going to be much of a game. I think Kansas is, is going to play really well, and they, they probably clean up. Um, but Kansas plays UNLV. UNLV gets a bowl game for the first time in a while. Uh, second place in the Mountain West. Lost to Boise State. Hell of a first year for Barry Odom. He's just got to keep up the momentum, man. Continue to hit the, like, poach the transfer portal, man. There are a lot of guys that are not going to be able to get to another Power 5 school that are very talented. If you know that there's guys out there like that, especially some guys in Utah, like, some guys from Utah literally just entered the transfer portal this weekend. That's how deep Utah is. They have a bunch of four stars coming in, and guys are like, okay, I don't know if I'm going to play, so I'm going to leave. I, UNLV should be poaching them immediately. A lot of big, talented kids over there, right? All over the nation. UNLV should hit that transfer portal hard. I think it's an excellent place to play. You have a brand new football facility. You play in Allegiant Stadium, so an excellent. You have an excellent stadium. Um, the the school has more resources towards the program than they have in years past, and I'm sure that's part of the reason why Barry Odom said, "Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll be the head coach." Um, and it's in it's Vegas, man. It's a destination. If you get a, if you're an athlete. NAL is minimal, but still, if you're an athlete in Vegas, there's no way you wouldn't have a good time. A lot of things to do. There's no way you wouldn't have a good time. I think UNLV could really could really shine in the Mountain West and do do so for years to come, especially, you know, with NIL being what it is, if they can find ways to, to get, you know, the right players' money, there's no state income tax in Nevada. They can take advantage of the same thing that a lot of other teams, are like like the Raiders, are taking advantage of. A lot of players want to go play there because they just there's no state income tax. You don't pay taxes, or you, you pay federal taxes. You don't pay state taxes. So, um, UNLV's got some advantages. They got some newer facilities compared to the rest of the Mountain West. It should be interesting to see how competitive they stay. Really, should be very interesting. I I really like the odds, but it is what it is. 
Um, I, I think UNLV is going to hit a buzzsaw against Kansas, but this has been an excellent season. Going nine and four, nine and five in your first season is is tremendous, tremendous, especially because the team couldn't make a bowl game with Marcus Arroyo. So Barry Odom and his staff deserve a ton of credit. The players deserve a ton of credit. Um, the veterans that stayed around or, or the seniors that stayed around, they deserve a ton of credit. What a great, what a great year for UNLV. When we get back, we're going to go dive right, we're going to dive right into the Golden Knights. Golden Knights are still on pace to have an excellent season. They're still one of the top teams in the West. When we get back here on the Sin City Sports Show, presented by IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Hello, sports fans. It's me, your boy, Larry B., and I want to walk you through the world of sports. No, no, no. Not just the mainstream major TV deal type sports, although those are important too. But let me be your guide to your journey of all sports, from college to the pros, the minors, and everything in between. Each week, we are talking sports galore with true diehards just like you from a hardcore fan's perspective that's sure to quench your thirst around leagues you may know all too well and some you may even discover here. That's right, sports fans. If you love sports of all kinds, enjoy hearing amazing sports stories and respect all sports because you know how difficult any of them can be to play or compete in, then this is your show. Join me, your boy Larry B, on the defining moment each week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports, and let the sports come to you. What's happening, sports fans? Are you a fan of Southern California sports? Are you looking for a show hotter than a hot summer day in California? Then look no further than the SoCal Supreme Sports Show, where I talk about all things Southern California sports. That's right, all sports teams from Southern California. From the hard-hitting tackles of the NFL, to the killer crossovers and big three-pointers of the NBA and WNBA, to the grand slams of the MLB, to the bone-chilling goals of the NHL, and to the booming kicks of the MLS, the SoCal Supreme Sports Show has it all for you. Oh, and let us not forget about the college sports as well. So join me, Taryn Rodriguez, every week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Football fans, this is me, your boy Larry B, inviting you to join myself, Callum Reynolds, Mike Pat, and John Felipe for one of the most electrifying football shows you have ever heard. Three and out, right here at IE Sports Radio. Recap of the week before, a preview of what's to come, and of course, three hardcore head to head prime time face offs each week. You don't want to miss it. up 
everybody. This is Taryn Rodriguez. Are you a fan of volleyball? Are you a fan of Thunder Spikes? Then I have the show for you. Set Point, where I cover NCAA men's and women's volleyball, high school boys and girls volleyball, beach volleyball, and even professional volleyball. Catch the action every week here on IE Sports Radio, your direct feed for all that is sports. Welcome back from the break here. This is the Sin City Sports Show presented by IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. I'm your host, Kale Henderson. You guys can get at us on our Twitter forums at Sin City underscore IESR at Kale underscore Henderson. Where we talk all things Vegas sports. Make sure you guys leave a like, follow, subscribe. It's free on our YouTube. If you guys miss the show, don't worry about that. We have many ways for you guys to review the show. Listen to the show back. Spreaker podcast, Spotify, Apple pods, Google pods. We're everywhere. Look for us. Listen in. Like. Follow. It helps the algorithms. We want to make this show bigger. Why not? It's going to be one of the biggest sports markets in America. I mean, it already kind of is. Uh, Roger Goodell, just today I seen an alert come across my screen. ESPN, Roger Goodell is commending Vegas for being one of the more popular and fastest growing sports towns. I've been saying this for almost two years now. This is the fastest growing sports market in America. There's just so much going on. You have Major League Baseball moving in. Um, that hasn't been vetoed yet. Somehow the A's haven't gotten in their own way somehow. But regardless, that's still probable. Um, Vegas Golden Knights are killing it. Returning and defending. Stanley Cup champs. Um, the Las Vegas Lady Aces, two straight years. Champs. Champs. The uh, Ramblers of the NBA were was the champion just a year ago. A lot of winning football, right? UNLV. And honestly, I think the Raiders are, are on the up and up too. I mean, you can only go up from where we've been. But still, I think the Raiders will be on the up and up too. The A's are going to really benefit from, you know, the way the league is. It's essentially, you know, the teams with the most money tend to win. And it's because there's no cap constraints. There really isn't. You can pay you can pay luxury tax after you spend so much money, but there's no cap constraints for Major League Baseball uh, teams. So they can go out and spend four hundred million dollars on a roster if they want to. They have to pay the tax on it, but they they can go out and spend that. That's what makes baseball different. Where a lot of other sports like the NFL have a hard cap. You go over that cap, you get fined. You go over that cap, you then you have to have a tough discussion about those players. That's why um, so many NFL teams now have like basically people just designated accountants and and, and front office members just dedicated um, to managing the cap, managing the space, the future years, what what's coming up, uh, draft picks. Like they're so in tune and so in depth with their with their cap space that. They can legitimately go to the coach and say, hey, coach, you guys sign these free agents. This is the type of money we have left. We just really can't afford a first-round pick, or we can't afford a second-round pick this year. We should think about trading that away for a player, or we should think about trading that away for, for future picks or trading back, right? Like, that's how in-depth these NFL teams are. They budget really well, and they know what they can and can't spend, and uh yeah, it's it's just that you guys seen that scene in draft day, right? Where Kevin Costner looked over at uh, Jennifer Garner. Jennifer Garner's character is obviously the love interest, and, and she's pregnant and all that other jazz. But um, she's the cap analyst, and he looks over at her and he's like, "Do we have enough? Do we have enough money for multiple first round picks?" Like that's they have it down to a science, man. When they go into free agency, obviously you're not going to hit on everybody you want to hit on. You have an idea of what your hit list is, but you're not going to hit on everybody you hit on. The guys that you hit take up cap. The other 53 projected guys that you think will make the roster will hit the cap. The other thing you have to worry about is those draft picks. And the NFL is so good at budgeting that they just know 
oh, I don't know if, if a third-round pick is going to fit into our salary cap. Coach, would you rather have a second-round pick or a third-round pick? Or, Coach, would you rather have two third-round picks and no second-round pick? Like, they are that detailed now and that smart when it comes to money. That way they can remain under the cap and do what they have to do to make the team better. I, The NFL is just a different spot. Baseball doesn't have to worry about that. And I think the A's will benefit from it. I think the I think the Las Vegas A's is so weird to say. The Las Vegas A's will benefit from that. I would love to see a bit of a color scheme change. I'd like to see a bit more black. Black and gold. That just seems to be the theme in Vegas. Um, obviously the green and, and the gold will be just fine. It's not like they have to change much, but um, I like the idea of maybe having some alternates, some black and greens, or like almost like a mallard color. Um, in some in some instances, like alternate jerseys for the A's. Um, excited for the A's. Excited for A's fans. They finally have you know a place. I, I do feel bad for Oakland fans, Oakland A's fans, because I know that they were devout. They were devout. I mean, they were there all the time, with the exception of that one video of the guy. Well, his girlfriend was yeah in the middle of the game and good for him, but really bad optics, right? <laughs> Your stands are so empty that people can see that pretty ridiculous. Um, Oakland A's fans are passionate. They, they make it to a ton of games. They don't have to, the teams never, they're not usually good. They really aren't. I think they have a good team once every three years, theoretically a team that can make it to the second round of the playoffs once every three to four years which isn't bad. It's just because of their money constraints, they have to build their team and develop their team in a different way than a lot of other teams do. I don't know if that'll be the case. I think they'll be in the upper half, half upper echelon or upper half of the Major League Baseball Association moving forward. Major League Baseball. I, I truly believe that. Um, the Golden Knights are, are still on a tear. Golden Knights are, are killing it. Um, I still believe they are number one in the West. I'll double check on that, but I'm, I'm pretty positive. Last I checked, they were number one in the West still. Yep, first the Pacific Division standings. Let's take a look at the West. Uh, Western Conference in general, they are 16-5-5. Five and five. They, have, they have 37 points. Yeah, they're number one in the West. They're number one in the West by about two games. Two games. If you were looking at the Central Division, they're... Number one in the rest by two and a half games. So, uh, Golden Knights are keeping pace. They're doing an excellent job. Let's look at the Eastern Conference. Because last year, I mean, oh, wow, the Bruins and, and, and the Golden Knights are kind of staying neck and neck. What a what a Stanley Cup final that would be, by the way. I think the Rangers would be an excellent test for the Golden Knights as well. The Rangers are a really good team. Jonathan Quick is having another unbelievable season. I'm sure they touched base on this a little bit on the neutral zone, but Jonathan Quick's just having, you know, and I know a lot of it has to do with New York has a ton of talent and it's probably making things a lot easier for Quick than what he was used to over the years. Uh, but Jonathan Quick is still a hell of a goalie. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think he's doing an excellent, I think he's doing an excellent job for the Rangers. He's a huge reason why they've started out so well. They're 37 points. So Bruins and Rangers are both at 37 points. That's kind of crazy, man. Eastern Conference always has some really thick and tough, tough uh, outings. But the one thing I can tell you about the Eastern Conference is they tend to hurt each other too. Like they tend to just beat the crap out of each other. So that way, other than those years that Tampa Bay won, and it's Tampa Bay. So what are you going to do? Like Tampa Bay had one of the best teams assembled in NHL history. Um, other than that, like it seems as though the East just tends to pummel each other. It feels like the years that the West wins – it's because the East just beat each other up. For example, I think the Golden Knights were the best team in, in NHL last year, and they proved that, right? Uh, especially putting up nine goals in the game, you know, game five to clinch it in Vegas, which was poetic in, enough in the first, in your in your inaugural so sixth year as a as a franchise. Um, I I'll say it like this. I I think the NHL is in the best place it could possibly be in. I truly do. I, I think that baseball is starting to suffer. I think basketball is still popular, but it just, it, it doesn't get the viewership that football does. Right. So in the off season, I think now is a prime time for the NHL to really push, push their, their product out there. Get it on ESPN plus, get it on Peacock, get it on whatever you can. Cause people have it. And get people watching the game again. 
because it's really exciting, especially playoff hockey, man. It doesn't feel like there's a ton of scoring, and I say that, but last year there's a crap load of scoring. Um, again, Vegas winning game five, nine to three, was unbelievable. Um, back to what I was saying before, the Eastern Conference was so tough, even Florida, who was probably the worst team in that playoff, went on a run at the right time and just beat the crap. And it was almost, they just beat the crap out of each other, the whole East side. And when, when they got to play Vegas, yes, Vegas was the better team, but I don't know, man. I, I think Vegas would have had some issues if they would have had to play a healthy Bruins team. I just think that matchup is a little bit different. So it should be fun. I think those those types of matchups are what we dream of when it comes to the NHL or the Stanley Cup Finals. Two of the best teams in the league, and right now you got three teams tied at 37 points in, in the Golden Knights, our Golden Knights, the Boston Bruins, and the New York, New York Rangers. Which is crazy because two of the original, like, NHL teams, the Bruins and, and the Rangers, man, like, what? You serious? They're playing that well? It's excellent. Adam says, LOL, I'm shocked about Northwest. Yep, we talked about that earlier, man. I, Dude. Northwest had an amazing season. 100%. Better than the Bears. I wonder what's going to happen with Eberflus. You let me know. I don't know if it's looking good, man. Especially if Jim Harbaugh has legitimate, you know, interest. I would start looking at an offensive-minded guy if I was Chicago. You have two young quarterbacks. I really like Tyson. Um, I really like Tyson Badgett. I really do. I think he's got tools that you can't teach, and he needs an offensive line and a team around him. Um, but overall, Justin Fields, I don't know what to do with him. I think there needs to be an outright competition next year. See what's happening. It can't just be because he's a first-round pick. Um, you know, you you seen what happened with the kid in – 49ers jersey just didn't it just didn't you know it didn't work out what by the way what a draft whiff and yet the team is still amazing like they whiffed on that quarterback but they're still absolutely stacked in the Niners uni that's how good John Lynch and, and uh, Kyle Shanahan have done Adam chimes in Harbaugh would be such a fun hire I agree I agree I this is the this has been my stance for a while as we transition to the Raiders talk I believe that, and I, it's, it's going to sound weird, there's a really good possibility. I, I do believe that Antonio Pierce could keep the job for the Raiders. I think if the Raiders continue to stay competitive, uh, especially with the roster they have, um, I, I think that they will continue to stay competitive. What I would tell you is, What I would tell you is, if Jim Harbaugh has legitimate interest in being the Raiders head coach, with his past, and I know him and Mark Davis are buddies, they may not be Gruden and Davis buddies, but they're still buddies, and they know each other, and he, and, and Mark Davis has pursued Jim Harbaugh in the past. Listen, folks, before he was a Niners coach, Jim Harbaugh was sought after by the Raiders. The Raiders were just an absolute dumpster fire, right? Right after Al Davis died. Jim Harbaugh would have been an amazing hire. He would have been amazing for Derek Carr, all that jazz. Okay, when when Mark Davis was looking for a new coach, I do believe that he set the feelers out for Jim Harbaugh before hiring McDaniel's. He says that McDaniel's was his first and only hire, but I don't know. And you're right, Adam. Any coach, okay, any coach with a big name right now, with as fast as Vegas is growing and the eyes on them, like. How big was Gruden when he was the coach of the Raiders? Like, he was Vegas football. No joke. And there's a possibility Gruden could come back. There are talks. I was watching NBC Sports and listening to Mike Florio, and he was interviewing um, some lawyers because I think Mike Florio is is a is a law. He has a law degree. He practices law. Um, he was saying that, you know, there are there is word out there that if, if the NFL – would be willing to drop if the NFL would would it sounds like the NFL would be willing to settle with John Gruden and just turn a blind eye if Mark Davis were to rehire him as the head coach. I wouldn't be upset with that either. Look guys, emails are emails. What he said was horrible, okay? I'm not going to say it wasn't, but it was 12 years ago. And when you listen to his players talk about him like Warren Sapp, Keyshawn Johnson and stuff, 
None of them guys believe that John Gruden's a racist. None of them guys believe that he's a bad person. Okay, so I'm not sure. Maybe the context he was saying was true, but it wasn't a very good thing. And honestly, John Gruden was really colorful back then. Like, he 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 didn't have that that maturity and stuff that that he once had. He was a hot shot for a while in the NFL, man. I think he had to go earn his way at ESPN and and really um, have people mentor him in, in in ways to being a more Disney oriented character. You could tell that he was just a different coach in his second stint with the Raiders. I don't think that guy that was that was let go or or basically forced to resign. Um, I don't think he was the same guy that sent that those emails, and I, I have a hard time believing that. Raiders are one of the few franchises in the NFL where the head coach could truly be the face of the organization. True, I think the Raiders are one of the most unique franchises in the NFL historically. Um, you know, they're they're a top five NFL team franchise all time, and I think people would have a hard time disagreeing with that. I, I think you have, you know, now it's the Patriots. We, you have to have the Patriots, right? When we talk about all-time teams, Patriots. Um, I think Chiefs would be top ten. Their recent popularity would put them in the top five. But all-time is what I'm talking about. And I, I would just say that the mystique of the Raiders just trumps the Chiefs. Um, it's a great rivalry, and they've owned that rivalry, you know, for the last decade or so. But overall, the, the Raiders is a more synonymous team in the NFL. It's, more, it's, it's a far more, I think it's more well-known. Patrick Mahomes put the Chiefs back on the maps. Don't, let's, not be, let's be real. Patrick Mahomes is the dude. He put them back on the map. But the reality is the Raiders are a license to print money. I think they're, they're, they would be number five because you have the Patriots, the Cowboys, Niners, um, why am I thinking the Steelers? Okay. Patriots, Cowboys, Niners, Steelers. Those are four teams that I think of where you're like, dude, they were some of the best football franchises we've seen in all of the NFL. Right? I have no problem putting the Raiders at five because of their mystique, because of their three Super Bowls, because of the Al Davis way, the Raider way, right? It was just different. That the song. Everybody knows the song. The Autumn Wind is a Raider. Everyone knows that. When they hear it, they're like, yeah, that's Raiders theme song. I put the Packers probably at six because um, they're up there. They were title town for the longest time. There's just so many legendary franchises in the NFL. Uh, but, yeah, if, I mean, if you were going to start with a list, like the most popular is probably the Cowboys. Um, the most successful or the best ever. Uh, I mean, you have to, you know, talk about the Steelers and Patriots because they were they were both, you know, six apiece. No other, t no other teams have done that. Um, the Cowboys and Niners share five. The Cowboys and Niners both have five, I believe. Uh, they, they've, they've been an excellent couple franchises. Raiders have three. Chiefs have three. You could definitely put them in the top ten now. They're probably, I don't know if all time they're better than the Packers overall. Um, I cannot believe, here's, here's an astronomical stat, right? The Packers in a 30-year span had... Brett Favre and Aaron Rodgers, and they only had two Super Bowls. What? Marcus, what's up, brother? Thank you for tuning in. The Packers, and I know this is off topic, but we're just talking about relevant franchises, right? The Raiders being, in my opinion, the number five in, in NFL history. Uh, and number five, two, again, the Cowboys, the Patriots, the Niners, the Cow... Yeah, sorry, Cowboys, Patriots, Niners, Steelers, Raiders. Those would be the five that come to mind when I think of the NFL. Nothing against any other team. There's a lot of really good teams. And you could argue a lot of them in the top ten. But those are the top five, in my opinion, in NFL history. Right there. Right? Cowboys, Niners, Patriots, Steelers, Raiders. And it's a really good list of top five. It'd be hard to argue that. The Raiders team would probably be the only one that you could think of. Okay, maybe the Packers get in before that. But I don't think so. I think the mystique and the popularity of the Raiders puts them probably in the top three in the NFL. But all-time franchises, I, I have to list those teams that have won more Super Bowls. It's just, it is what it is, man. It's part of habit. The Broncos, you could put up there in the top ten. Chiefs, um, uh, Green Bay. Man, Chicago has a lot of it, but they're just, they've been a poorly run franchise for years. I don't know, it's a really good debate. It's a really good debate.
I mean, after the Raiders, I think it's clear to say the Packers, um, Chiefs, Broncos, all of them have a number of titles. Um, I don't know what why I'm blanking on some of the other teams. There's quite a few teams that still haven't won a championship, which is crazy. It's just nuts. And I, I listen, man, if you want to talk about those top five franchises, the team with the most room to grow right now would be the Raiders. Right? The Steelers, you could argue, Mike Tomlin's going to do a great job. I think they'll always have a winning season under him um, until they want to make a change. But uh, the Raiders have the most room to grow because of how bad they've been. And there's a possibility John Gruden could be back. I would love the Jim Harbaugh hire if it were to happen. Listen, Jim Harbaugh wins everywhere he goes. I would not shy away from that at all. Not at all. Wouldn't feel bad. Jim Harbaugh is the man. Everywhere he goes, San Diego State, Stanford, uh, San Francisco, right? Michigan. Michigan's been unbelievably dominant the last three years in the Big Ten. They deserve credit for that. Jim Harbaugh deserves a ton of credit for that. They've had to recruit in different ways than other teams like Ohio State have, where they can just kind of offer NIL money and all that jazz. Michigan doesn't really do that. They're quiet about everything. Even if you think Jim Harbaugh is a weird dude, and I, I don't blame you. Think he's a weird dude all you want. But even if you think Jim Harbaugh's a weird dude, all he does is win. That's it. And I, I'm going to say this. I... Something in my mind tells me tells me that, that the Michigan Wolverines will lose to Alabama because Alabama looks to be the most improved and best team in, in college football right now. With the way they're playing on offense and defense, the way Jalen Milrow can really take over games, especially with his legs, I've been putting Jalen Milrow in that, that Vince Young conversation when Vince Young was really young and he was trying to really – become a polished passer by the time he was a senior or a junior um i totally see Jalen milrow being that type of player where he's going to rely on his legs this first year but after that we're going to start to see him really grow as a passer and he's already a better thrower of the football at his age than vince young was so Jalen milrow is a, is a deciding factor you're basically gonna have to have a spy for him all game which leaves somebody open um if alabama can take advantage of that that's great. But Michigan's really tough, man. They have one of the best defenses we've seen in decades, basically. Um, they're physical. What what a slobber knocker that first, that first playoff game is going to be. Michigan and, and Alabama. What a slobber knocker that's going to be. It's going to be an absolute knockdown, dragout fight between two blue blood programs. Unbelievable. I fear Michigan will lose in the semifinal because that's what Michigan does. It has nothing to do with that. I think, I just think their matchup is tough, man. If they would have landed Florida State, I think Michigan rolls Florida State, right? I think that's what Michigan wanted was Florida State to get in because I think Michigan felt that, hey, we just beat Ohio State. We've had a couple, you know, top 25 wins. We're probably the number one team in the nation. I think by the eye test, I think Michigan would beat Washington right now. Um Michigan's got the worst run of it. If Michigan gets past Alabama, I almost want to crown them. Because I don't know if, I don't, Texas is really, really, really good, man. They're really talented. I think they're ahead of schedule under Sarkeesian. Um, do I think that Texas is better than Michigan? Probably not. I don't even think Texas is better than Alabama right now. So this this playoff, in my opinion, was was fine. I know a lot of people have heat. Everyone's crying for Florida State. Listen, man, shit happens, okay? They're still going to play in a really important game. This is what I can tell you. Georgia was the number one team for almost 29 straight games. Almost 30 straight games. Georgia was the number one team. Alabama beat them, and they were a really good football team. You could argue that the, the quarterback they have now is better than Stetson Bennett. More talented, I would say. Maybe not winningest, but more talented than Stetson Bennett. That's how good Georgia is. Harrison Beck is is a beast. I think that's his name. Carson Beck. Sorry, Carson Beck's a beast. And he was throwing darts, man. I just think Alabama played really well. They had a better game plan. They had a better coaching staff. Nick Saban knows what to do. It's going to be a crazy first... first and I see Texas getting past uh, Washington because I think Texas... 
they're really built to be an SEC school. I think I think Sarkeesian's ahead of the ahead of the curve on that. They have a huge offensive line, big athletic defensive line. Um, I just think the fronts, even though Washington's fronts are very physical, they're more blue collar, down to earth guys, right? Because you just don't really know those dudes. They don't have a sweat on their team like Texas does. That'll be a real. I think again, physical in the trenches. I, I truly believe the playoff committee got this one right. They had to make a hard decision, but they made the right one for business. They made the right one for – because I, I just don't think Florida State makes it past that first round. And why would you put a team in if you don't think they have a chance to win? They would easily be the fourth best team in the playoff. I think I think fifth best team is generous. I think Georgia is a better team than Florida State is. And we're going to find out real quick. I think Florida State gets the crap kicked out of them by Georgia. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, well, I guess I – guess Maybe leaving them out wasn't a bad idea. That's what's going to happen. I think Georgia wins by a few scores. I don't care about the Jordan Travis mess because the, that hasn't been a part of the argument the entire time. If Jordan Travis was healthy, do I think Florida State would have been team four? Yes. Yes. I think Florida State would have been number three, to be exact. I think Texas would have been four, and they earned it, right? Um, what I, what I would say is this. Even if Florida State had Travis, I still think they get beat by Alabama. I still think that a Michigan team beats them. Um, they're really good. I just don't know if they're that team. I don't know about Washington. I'm still not quite sold on Washington, no matter how good they look. Penix has been unbelievable. But that team, like Washington to me, could be the fourth best team at number two. And those are just my thoughts. We're going to find out real quick um, come New Year's Day or New Year's Eve. We're going to find out real quick which teams are what. But that's where I stand. I totally believe that Michigan could win it all this year. I just – something in my gut says Saban's going to figure it out, and he has. Like look at what Milrow's done. Look at the growth he's had. Look at the whole team is just a different team than when they played Texas early in the season, right? The, even a couple weeks after Texas, Alabama was struggling. Since then – other than that Hail Mary against Auburn, which is a rivalry game, so I don't really think much of it. Texas or, or uh, Alabama's been dominant. Texas has just been a really good team since Quinn Ewers got back. They're dynamic. They're unbelievable. I think the, Cow the Oklahoma State Cowboys are a good football team. They just got the crap kicked out of them by a, a much better team. In Texas, and Steve Sarkeesian just very creative in play calling. That could be an edge difference in that Washington game too. Steve Sarkeesian's been in big games. He's called plays in big games. I mean, I don't know, man. The, kudos to Washington and their staff. But I, I feel like Texas has the edge, and I think my gut, my heart says Michigan. Sh I want Michigan to win it all. I'd love to see Harbaugh hoist a trophy. I think he deserves it. He's a great dude. Excellent coach. He's a builder of winners. Um, my gut says Alabama's going to edge it out. And that's kind of where I'm sitting with the CFB as CFP right now. And I think they're pretty decent picks. And I, I think that this is an excellent set of matchups. Tough games. Tough physical games is what we're going to be seeing. The Raiders have the Chiefs this upcoming week coming off the bye. Antonio Pierce is kind of like the next five games are unbelievably crucial. If to Antonio Pierce could somehow find a way to go 4-1 and one in the next five games, I think he – I think he – they remove the interim tag. Now, here's the caveat. I, I've said this a, f a few times. If Jim Harbaugh is interested, you go get him. If you can, if you can, um, if the NFL can move past John Gruden and his lawsuit and settle with him and let him come back and coach, I think you go after John Gruden because I think John Gruden is a more seasoned, more polished coach than Antonio Pierce. But if neither one of those guys are serious about returning and coming back, then I truly believe you go with AP. Or look into Rich Passaccia. Don't be surprised if Rich Passaccia's name comes up. I think Mark Davis has a ton of respect for Rich Passaccia, especially with the way he led the team that back half of the season, tumultuous season in 2021. Tumultuous. So bad. Like just unbelievable all the crap that happened. The, the emails, the, the, uh, the vehicular homicide, everything. It just couldn't have been worse. Right? Couldn't have been worse for the Raiders that year. 
So, a lot of good things, I think, are on the horizon for the Raiders. They just have to get it in order, and Mark Davis has to get out of his own way. Hire experts to run the football side of things, right? If Champ Kelly is someone he believes in to formulate a roster and put a coach in a position to win, I think that needs to be said when he's having interviews. When he has, when he talks to John Gruden, when he talks to Jim Harbaugh, I think he needs to let them know, hey, I'm going to give Champ Kelly the final roster decisions. I need you guys to focus on coaching. And I think both of those guys would do that. Because I don't believe Mark Davis is an a-hole. I think he know, he he believes in what's best for the Raiders. And uh, he was willing to make that step when he got rid of McDaniels four games in. So I have mad respect for him, man. He's been the problem for the last couple decades, or the last decade or so. But he's showing, hey, if he has to make a tough decision, if he has to eat some crow, he will. And I appreciate that about him. Um, Aiden O'Connell. Touch base on him real quick before we, before we end the show. I think Aiden O'Connell needs to start the rest of the season. There were some I – was, I was reading something on, on Twitter where, like, people were like, oh, I don't know what you're talking about, man. Like, we, we need to have – we need to have uh, Jimmy Garoppolo in because Aiden O'Connell struggling. Yeah, he's going to struggle. That offensive line's not very good. You know, they allow pressures on almost like, what is it, 48% of the snaps. I think they had one game where it was they were one of the best in the, in the league. And, of course, it's the game after I talk crap about them. But the reality is the O-line, when you look at it, it's not good. It's not very good. You have a young quarterback holding the ball probably a little too long. Um, I think the routes tend to develop a little bit longer than they need to sometimes. I have no idea where those quick outs to run a Renfro and stuff went. They just have to continue to revisit it, man. Get that guy the ball early. It's going to open things up for everybody else. Josh Jacobs is running like a madman. Like his first few weeks, he was not a top five back. His his He's now in the top five rushing and could could go for the rushing title again with the way things are going. I, Raiders play the Chiefs, man. It's going to be a tough game. Chiefs are coming off, I think, what, two straight losses? It's going to be a very tough game. I don't think the Chiefs are going to take it lightly. The, the good news is the Raiders are coming off of a week of rest and preparation, an extra week of preparation for the Chiefs. If Antonio Pierce can really put together a competitive game plan and make adjustments at halftime, right? That's what I've seen from this staff, this interim staff, that's been concerning, right? Everything else has been great. Adjustments have been horrible. It seems as though against good teams, the adjustments are just better because they're better coaches. Um, I hope that's not the case. I hope it's just Antonio's young. But the reality is the adjustments of the Raiders have been poor. If that doesn't change any good team that the Raiders play the rest of the season, it's going to be a tough game. It's going to be a tough out. I am, I like Antonio Pierce. If if Mark Davis said, yeah, let's roll with him. I love his personality. I love the way he's galvanized the team. I wouldn't shadow, shy away from it. I, I, I totally believe in Antonio Pierce. If Jim Harbaugh or John Gruden aren't truly interested in coming back. This is the Sin City Sports Show presented by IE Sports Radio. Your direct feed for all that is sports. Get at us on our Twitter forums at SinCity underscore IESR at Kale underscore Henderson where we talk all things Vegas sports. If you missed the show, no worries, man. Go to Spotify, Spreaker, uh, Apple Pods, Google Pods. You guys can catch up on the show, like, follow, uh, help the algorithms. And as always, folks, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Kale Henderson. Love, peace, and hair grease, my friends. Oh, <laughs>